Well, it's really good to be back with you all. I'm shocked to have been gone so long. I was away for two weddings. Two weeks ago, our younger daughter was <clears throat> married in North Carolina. It was a happy time to, to be together. And then last week, I was in Arkansas. Uh, Bob Tucker's uh, youngest child, Catherine, was, was married. On the way back uh, last Sunday, I was live streaming, which was really kind of fun. I don't normally get to do that. A uh, couple of things. One, it's great. You put the phone on the dashboard and you can sing away without restraint. That was pretty, pretty wonderful. But also to just let the crew know how uh, far our live stream sound has come from the early days of COVID to now. It was just brilliant and beautiful sound. Not that I recommend you stay home from church in order to get the great sound of the live stream. It's better here. But it's good to know when you're traveling that there's, there's a way to stay connected in worship. Well, I'm grateful to uh, Colton and Darren who uh, held the pulpit the virtual pulpit, as it were, uh, so, so beautifully while I was gone. And I'm glad to be taking up with you these, uh, this look at the stories of Joshua now for the next few weeks. So last week, uh, Darren got us set up by looking at chapter one, the big picture of God calling his people finally out of the wilderness to uh, enter the promised land uh, and begin the conquest of Canaan. Today, we're going to zero in on a very small aspect of that story from chapter two. Let's pray to the Lord for his, his mercy. Lord God, we are grateful to be gathered here. We're well aware and grateful for those who are able to travel, whether it's uh, Whitney and Annette who are uh, landing or have landed in Europe now and with some others, or whether it's uh, with the Woods who are going off on mission trips, each of their family throughout the summer, whether it's our youth trips or just simply being able to take vacation. We're grateful for the graduates and for um, just all that's in motion. But we're glad that for this time, we get to be present and stabilized in front of your word. So be faithful, we pray, uh, to speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, it's a bit of a long story, but it's a fabulous story. So follow as you would. So Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies saying, go view the land, especially the city of Jericho. And they went, and they came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab, and they lodged there. Now it was told to the king of Jericho, behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. And the king of Jericho sent word to Rahab, saying, bring out those men who have come to you who entered your house, for they've come to spy out all the land. But Rahab, the woman, had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, true, the men did come to me, but I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, why the men went out? I do not know where the men went. Why don't you pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them? But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax that she laid out in order on the roof. So the men pursued the spies after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords. And then the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. Well, before the men lay down, Rahab came up to them on the roof and said to them, men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the fear of you has fallen upon us. All the inhabitants of our land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord I am dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. We've heard what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. Soon as we heard it, our hearts melted. There was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord I am, your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord I am, that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house. Give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them. Deliver our lives from death. The men said to her, Our life for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. So Rahab let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was built into the city wall so that she had lived in that wall. The mysterious ways of God are indeed difficult to understand. 
how he has spies everywhere because the secret things belong to the Lord our God. <clears throat> now we may do all the words of this law. Well, good storytellers know an important technique about telling an epic historical story. If you want to hold people's attention about the big movements of history, you've got to be able to find a way to also tell the story in a very personal way. You can't just have armies moving and hold people's attention. You've got to find particular people and their story and how it fits into the whole. Well, nobody tells stories better than the writers of the Bible. And so in chapter 2, after setting it up with Joshua getting ready to lead all the people into Canaan, we zero in on two Israelite spies and one Canaanite prostitute. And their story gives us a meaning to the whole story. Plus, this story has the letting down of spies through a window to escape. All great adventure stories, you've got to get let out of a window somehow, right? In a basket, maybe? Maybe you read to your children or your grandchildren the stories of Babar the Elephant. If you did, you know the story of the mystery of Babar, one of the best in the series. And by the way, if you haven't read your kids the Babar books, you need to correct that immediately. These are beautiful children's books. And well, there you see the beloved character of the old lady being let down in a basket from her lighthouse tower where she writes her books, where the crocodile, you can see him on the second floor, had been trying to devour her. But it was all part of a plan. They let her down in the basket on the winch, and Babar now is closing up the tower with his great elephant bulk, so the crocodile will be captured, and the old lady is blissfully safe. A great escape. Well, there's great escapes like that in the Bible. In Acts chapter 9, as you see in this mosaic from the 12th century, the apostle Paul was let down in a basket, when they came to persecute him, Paul's disciples figured out a way to let him down in a basket. And Christian art through the centuries loves to portray this scene. This is from the 12th century in Montreal's cathedral. Pretty neat. Escape through a basket. Well, I want to retell you a story about when I had to escape through a window, but not to get out of something, but to get back into something. You're looking at university and college in Oxford, where I spent a summer, and it was wonderful and just amazing to see how that whole city works, but I didn't quite believe them when they said, the college door closes at 11. After that, it's locked. Surely not. It's hardly dark in England in July at 11. Students were out, but they were serious. If you weren't in by 11, the door was locked, the walls were high, and they completely encircled the college, you're going to spend the night on the streets. Unless. Unless you know the secret passed from student to student down through the centuries. Those windows there on the high street all have grids over them, wooden grids, so that you can open the window, but you can't go in and out of it. They'll block you, except for one. We went back a few years ago to see if this was still there. I almost feel like I'm betraying something to tell you this. But there is one window that has no grids. So if you're out with your friends and you need to get in, you can get a boost up, rap on that window, and the girl who occupied that room would open the window and let you in to go to your bed and be safe and inside. Now think about this poor girl. <laughs> it's the only way to get in after 11 in the whole college. All night long, American summer students, in and out, in and out, in and out, mainly in, mainly in. I felt bad for her, except that she loved it. She was the very center of the social scene. She knew everything about everybody. What you did, how long you did it, who you were with, and what you were about. She had all the scoops. Because the person with the window is at the hub of the social scene. That's how it was with Rahab. Her business was against the walls of Jericho. That made sense because when travelers were coming in and out, Rahab's business was connected to a lodge, an inn, a saloon, so to speak, the place where news was exchanged, where foreign people came. And if they needed her services, she was right there. 
she had a window on the wall and the walls were thick enough that you could have a room there. So when two Hebrew spies were sent to check out Jericho, the big city that they were soon to occupy, of course they went to the tavern. They went where Rahab was. One, because that's where visitors went and it would be a way for them not to be so noticeable. You wouldn't just go up to the king and say, hey, we're coming to conquer your land. How strong is your army? But on the other hand, they still didn't look quite right. They were easily found out. They were a different ethnicity, maybe a different language or at least a different accent, but most telling of all, their clothes. Think about it. The Hebrews had been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. The last robes they had that were new were 40 years ago. Right? It'd be like people from the 80s showing up and saying, we don't stand out, do we? I still have some clothes from the 80s, just because I want you to know they fit. Well, they were immediately found out. Word was sent to the king of Jericho. Two of those Hebrews, those people that we've seen with our own spies amassing over the Jordan in the east, they're here checking us out. The king of Jericho was not pleased with this, and so he sent immediately his men to Rahab saying, give them up. We've heard that men have come to you. Get rid of them. Give them to us. Well, Rahab said, well, they did come here, but they're not in my rooms anymore. They weren't. They were up on the roof hiding among the stacks of flax that she was drying in the sun. And then she said, I don't know where they went. Why don't you try pursuing them in case they went back to the Jordan? If you hurry, you can catch them. And I just love the little snippet of biblical humor that's in there. So the soldiers searching for the Hebrew spies went out. They ran out from the walls to pursue the Hebrews, according to Rahab's word. And the doors to the city were shut behind them because it was dark. So God's people were inside the city and their pursuers were locked out. Beautiful. Well, then it was time for Rahab and the spies to have a chat. And it was astounding what she said. Rahab said, look, we know that you serve the Lord I am. And by the way, we call him the Lord I am. It's the Hebrew Yahweh. Because Lord just sounds like such a generalized God. Everybody has a Lord who has a God. But the Hebrew word for their God, Yahweh, the Lord I am, I am who I am, is unique, particular. It's very important to this story. Because Rahab said, I know what has happened. We've heard the stories. How the Lord I am, your God, delivered you out of bondage in Egypt. We've heard how when you encountered the kings the, of Sheog and Og, that you destroyed them utterly. Your God is with you, and I want you to know we are terrified of you. That was news. Jericho was a proud city, full of wealth, full of violence, full of those bloodthirsty Canaanite gods. They didn't seem to be afraid of anyone. But when they heard about a God who actually delivered people, a God who was with these Hebrews who had survived 40 years in the wilderness, they were terrified. The way people who don't have a real God actually get when they're threatened. House of cards, all of Jericho. And then she said something more remarkable. As if she knew Deuteronomy chapter 4, which hadn't even been written down yet. She quoted Moses. She said, for the Lord, I am, your God is God of heaven and God on the earth. I know that. Rahab had made a confession of faith in the God of Israel that sounded exactly like Moses. Something's going on here. Rahab was willing to betray the gods of her people. She'd thrown in her lot entirely with the God of the Israelites. Well, some of that makes sense. So much of prostitution in those days was tied to a ritual service or sacrifice to a God. Ritual prostitution was a big part of it. So maybe if that's your life in service to a God, you're not actually finding that God very appealing. If this is what the God wants, I'm not sure I want this God. Maybe it was that. Maybe it was the recognition that none of this was working out anyway. 
But for whatever reason, Rahab was loyal immediately to the God of the Israelite spies. And she wanted something from them. And I'm a little bit astounded by this to find that Rahab was not cynical. She had not lost all sense of loyalty or optimism. She said, I want you to promise if I hide you, that you will protect my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all who belong to them on the day when you conquer this city. Now, I'm not sure about then, but I'm pretty sure I've not read many sociological studies today that talk about the connectedness in the nuclear families of people who have been given over to prostitution. It's usually just the opposite. Disconnection, broken relationships, disloyalty. But here's Rahab saying, what matters to me is that you protect my family. I want you to care for them. If you do so, I'll protect you. Well, the spy said, okay, our life for your life. We're in with you. Here's the deal. When we get ready to attack and you see our armies massing, put a scarlet cord down outside your window and we will know that's the room we will not touch. But make sure your family's inside. We're not responsible for anybody outside that room. But whoever is inside that room, we swear with our lives, we'll protect you. So the deal was struck. And then Rahab let the Hebrew spies down through her window. And they escaped and went back to tell the news. Isn't that a grand story? It's so personal. It's so adventurous. It's so surprising. What are we to make of this? What do we do with the story of Rahab, the Canaanite harlot? Well, I think the first thing to note is that Rahab is mentioned three more times in the New Testament, which that's a lot for an Old Testament character if your name isn't Jacob or Abraham or Moses. She's mentioned in Hebrews 11, the great hall of faith, where Moses and Abraham and Noah and David are all mentioned as believers who trusted in God. And then in the midst of this list of patriarchs is mentioned Rahab, the prostitute, who by faith hid the Hebrew spies and helped them to escape. The next book of the Bible, James, the book that convicts everybody for our lack of putting our faith into practice, holds up Rahab, the prostitute, who by her works proved her faith when she hid the spies and helped them escape. Two New Testament books praising Rahab for faith and works. And then in Matthew chapter 2, Rahab is one of the five women included in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. That's pretty neat. You got a prostitute who has a genealogy how does this work well evidently in the Lord's redemption when Rahab threw in her lot with God's people she got a husband his name was Salmon and he was the father of Boaz remember Boaz who married Ruth the Moabitess who was the great grandmother of David the king who was the ancestor of Jesus Christ God wove Rahab into the very fabric of his people so deeply she becomes a key ancestor in our Savior's life himself. It tells us so much, doesn't it? It tells us that it's never been about ethnicity. It's always been about God's call for the world to respond to him in faith and join him. It tells us that God has always been about calling people to himself in order that they might call others. Why has God called you to have faith right now in Jesus Christ? Not so you can sit home only and rejoice and say, boy, it's good to be in. Too bad about those other idiot people in Jericho who don't know the one true God. No, it's so that he can use you as part of his plan of redemption to bring others to himself. Just as he used Rahab to bring us our Redeemer. Such a beautiful story. I think another thing we noticed is that Rahab had her priorities right. She understood first that the most important thing is to worship and adore the one true God. 
She didn't have the kind of cynicism or even worldly wise cosmopolitan sense to say, well, you Hebrews have one God, the Canaanites have some other gods, and it's really all about finding your path to the one true reality anyway, so it doesn't really matter how you worship. No, she didn't say that. She declared, I know that your God is the God who acts in history. He is the only God who has power and truth. I'm all in with him which led to her second priority, which was family. I want you to save my mother, my father, my brothers, my sisters, and their families. I think Rahab today would say, remember what matters. Turn off your screens and look at each other. Remember what matters. Slow down and take one night to stay home with each other. Remember what matters. Leave the work. It'll keep. Be with your family. That's what you're here for. God and family. And thirdly, her third priority, the community of faith. God used Rahab to save these representatives of his people in order that all of God's people might pass safely into Canaan. She was concerned about the people of God because of their mission to the world. Beautiful. So Rahab is hugely important. She has these great priorities Third and lastly, maybe most importantly, the story of Rahab tells us that God delights to use what is our disgrace to further his purposes and create salvation in us and in others. God is not reluctant. He's not thwarted by the things in our past that we would regret, cataclysmic mistakes, horrible moral choices, great failures. All of those, he says, make perfect soil for the stories of redemption he would like to tell through us. Now, the evil one, the accuser of our souls, likes to tell us those things that you did, they are horrible. And if people knew, you would be rejected. And God, in particular, hates that. And he wants to reject you if you admit them. So just keep it covered and present a good front. That's a lie. God actually likes to take the things that we have done and say, bring that to me. Offer it up and watch how I use the very places of your brokenness and even sinfulness as a bridge to other people in similar condition. As a connection of empathy only you have. I use your very worst places as your best ministry. Think about someone like, we call him blind Bartimaeus. That's not how his story ended. He was seeing Bartimaeus. Jesus healed him. Why do we still call him blind Bartimaeus? Because it's his redemption from that brokenness, that disability, that makes him so significant. We call her Rahab the harlot. Not because she stayed a harlot. She became a wife and a mom. But because it's the connection to God's redemptive story in her life. We call him Doubting Thomas. That's ridiculous. On one hand, nobody ever said more than Thomas did about Jesus or could. My Lord and my God, he called Jesus. But we call him Doubting Thomas because he's the bridge. He's the connection to all of us who doubt and have skepticism and questions and struggles. Let me tell you the story about Doubting Thomas. This is what happened to him. So too, what happens in our lives? It's not meant to be stuffed. It's meant to be brought into the light because when shame comes into the light, it vanishes in the forgiveness of Christ and people can no longer hold it over your head if you're not hiding it. But you can also discover the ways that you minister. All these labels that we might get slapped with. Oh my, there's the one who never saw it coming. There's the guy who's a failure in every business he tried. There's the one who doesn't know how to keep his pants up There's the one who never saw a bottle he couldn't empty. There they are, name after name. All perfect material for the Lord to use. In the great hall of faith, Rahab the harlot, who became an ancestor of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
So the last thing to say about all that then, isn't it remarkable that after the Hebrews talked about their deal with her, she said, as you have said, so be it. How much that echoes her descendant, Mary, who when faced with the impossible news that though you have no husband, you're going to have a baby who's going to be the savior of the world, said, let it be to me according to your word. Here in these two women, the very essence of faith that leads to transformation. God, you have spoken. Let it be to me according to your word. You can do things that you promised beyond imagination. So when you go forth this week, let those words be ready on your lips. Lord, according to your words, so be it. Open my eyes to how you use what has happened and what I have done as a bridge to your mission with my life. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for owning Rahab. Thank you for working through her to bring the knowledge of you to the whole world. So let it be to us according to your word. Open our eyes this week to all that you want to do through us. In Jesus' name, amen.